This is the third video in our series that goes along with our article published in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis entitled A Primer for Using Multi-Level Models to Meta-Analyze Single Case Design Data with A-B Phases. In the first two videos, I showed you how to set up the data file and run the regression in SPSS version 26 for a Mac. In this video, I'm going to show you how to use the output from the regression that was run in video 2 to calculate an effect size. An effect size quantifies the relation between some outcome and some predictor. For us, we were interested in differential reinforcement of low rate behavior schedules and their impact on behavior. And so the effect size here would quantify the relation between the DRL schedule, the presence or absence of it, and the rate of behavior. With that context, let's get the Excel spreadsheet ready. So we're going to be pulling data out of SPSS and pasting it into this spreadsheet. I have color coded the columns here. In the yellow columns, we're going to paste in data from SPSS. And in the green columns, we will calculate values based on the data from the yellow columns. The very first variable is the unique identifier. This is the participant number. From that, we can determine what the study number is because we labeled the identifier as the first two digits being the study number. Next is the degrees of freedom. That comes from the ANOVA summary table, and so does the MSE. That's the mean square error. Next is the B phase. So B phase is the slope, or if you watched video two from this series, we call the slope pi in our regression equation. But B phase is the slope, that's the impact of the DRL schedule on behavior. SE phase is the standard error for that. And then we also were interested in the effect size for the interaction term, the time phase. So we have a B time phase and also a standard error or SE time phase. And then the rest of these I'll talk about a little bit later, but we're gonna calculate them based on all of these other yellow columns. Here is the output from the regression analysis that I conducted in video two of this series. And this, these regressions were run separately for each participant or case. And so because we split the file, um, the SPSS data file, to group the data by that unique identifier um, by each person, it, it groups them here. So I just wanna point out that what this structure looks like. So for this first person, it's 201, that's their identifier, they're from study two, and it's participant number one. And then within that, it gives you a couple different values, the regression, the residual, and the total. But these are the main outcomes or results that's presented in the ANOVA table for that person. And that's repeated for everyone else. What we need for this table is the degrees of freedom total. So that's from the third column for each identifier cluster. We need that value. And then we also need the mean square for the error term. And SPSS labels that as residual. So the residual column or row, mean square error, we need that value. So if I were just to copy and paste this whole table into Excel, I would have to do a lot of cumbersome filtering to get the exact values I need. I need something from the third row, I need something from the second row, and so I'd have to kind of copy and paste and delete out certain rows and columns. And there's a much easier way to get the data we need so that we can just copy and paste all of it over easily. So I'm gonna show you how to do that right now. We'll start by double clicking the table, and this brings up a formatting table option. Mine automatically brought up this pivoting trays, and this is actually where we need to go to do that. If that doesn't come up automatically, you can go to the pivot menu and then select the pivoting trays option, and this box will pop up. Now all you need to do is move this source that's over in the rows column. I'm going to move it over to the columns. And that automatically reformats formats our table so that each person takes up only one row of data instead of three rows of data like it did in the original table. We can X out of that. So now we're going to start moving the data to Excel. We'll start with the identifier. 
where I'm going to select all of those, copy them, and then paste them into my Excel file. All right, so now we need the degrees of freedom. So we go back to that table. And remember, we need the degrees of freedom total. So you go over to where the degrees of freedom are listed. It clusters the three degrees of freedom here together. So there's a column for regression, column for residual, and column for total. We need total. So I'll copy those and then paste them in. And the last thing we need is the mean square error. So there's mean square residual or mean square regression and mean square residual. Residual is the error. So we're going to highlight those, copy them, and paste them under MSE. Okay, so that is all we needed from the ANOVA table. So I can close out of that. Go back to the regular output and now we're going to scroll down to the coefficients table. The coefficients table is similar. It clusters each of the identifiers and then the different results we get for each identifier. So the coefficients table is actually telling us the value of the slope or pi from the regression equation. Now again, just like the other table, we want to reformat this a little bit so that we can easily copy and paste the data that we need. And the data that we need are the unstandardized coefficients, B, for phase and time phase, as well as the standard error for those. And that's just the next column over, this coefficient standard error. So to reformat this table, double click, open up the pivoting trays option, and we get a similar table as we did before. Now for this one, the reformatting we can move variables in rows to be first. And then this reformats the table so that it is split based on the predictor variable. Let me just show you what this looks like. So this first B for 201, they call it the constant. That is the intercept or pi sub zero from the regression equation. We don't need that. So I'm just going to scroll down. The next one is the time variable. That's the slope for the effect over time and baseline. We also don't need that. So then we get down to the phase variable. So just simply start at phase 201 and we're going to select both columns, the unstandardized B and the standard error for that. Go all the way down until you get to the time phase, copy, and then we can paste them in under B phase and the standard error for B phase. And then go back, get the time phase B and standard error. Paste that in. So that is all we needed from the SPSS data file. So first, I'm going to enter in the study number. And remember, the study number just comes from the first or first two digits from the identifier. So this first one is 201 would be study 2. These are all say 2. Next one is study 24, and so on. The rest of these all go into calculating the effect size called G. G is based on the slope and the mean square error. G is also multiplied by a bias correction, which is based on the number of observations. And we can get the number of observations based on the degrees of freedom total. De degrees of freedom total is calculated as the total number of observations minus 1. So to get the number of observations, we just have to enter a simple formula in this cell. So I'm going to write equals and then select the degrees of freedom plus 1. And that gives us the total number of observations. And then you can just double click in the bottom corner here. 
And so now we have all of the observations. So now I am going to type in the formula for phase. That is our G effect size for the phase variable. So G starts out by dividing the slope or pi, which we've labeled here as B phase. So this formula starts out as equal the B phase variable and divide that by the square root. So SQRT of the mean square error, put that in. And then that is multiplied by the bias correction. So the bias correction is one minus three, and that's divided by four times the number of observations, so that's I2 minus two, and then we subtract one. And that closes out the denominator for that. Just make sure we put in enough parentheses and hit enter. So I know in Excel, especially if you're not familiar with how to format equations in Excel, this looks a little bit complicated, but it is the same equation for G. And if you set the spreadsheet up in the same way that I set the spreadsheet up, you can just copy and paste this equation. And this is also available in the manuscript. So next we need to get the variance for the effect size G that it will be important for running the multi-level model. Variance is based on the standard error of the slope, so this SE phase, as well as the mean square error and the number of observations. It has the same bias correction at the end of the formula. So this formula is equals the SE phase, the standard error, which in the equation we label as S. So it's SE or S, and we need to square that. And then you divide it by the mean square error, so the same mean square error. And then all of this is multiplied by the very same bias correction, one minus three divided by four times the number of observations, minus two, minus one, and then close the parentheses. So there's our phase and our V phase, or our G for phase, and the variance for phase. You can use that same basic structure to put in the equations for time phase and for the variance for time phase. Now we can highlight all these and then double click on this bottom corner to drag the formula to the rest of the cells. Okay, and that's it. That is how we calculate the effect sizes and get the variance for the effect sizes for the phase and time phase variables that we're interested in in using our multi-level model. That model I will show you how to conduct in a program called R in videos 4 and 5. In our final data set, we also included some other variables. These are called moderators. Moderators are things that make an intervention more or less effective and could be things such as age or sex or other demographic variables, the diagnosis or level of disability, things about the particular study, um, for example, the target response type or how the procedure is run, so whether there's signals or not. So we can include any other thing that we want to explore into this data set. The very, very last thing is once you have this file all set up with all the moderators that you want to explore, you need to save the file as a .csv. So I'm going to do that right now. So we go to Save As, change the format at the bottom to a comma-separated value .csv, and then save it. The R program reads .csv file, so that's why we need to convert it to a .csv. All right, and that's it. We're done.